My reaction to the WHO announcement is really grounded in the true, the, the meaning to us all of the term pandemic. There's a formal epidemiological term, which is you know an epidemic that's uh, covering many parts of the globe. And in that sense, COVID is still a pandemic. It's it's an infection, but it's it's moving from uh, essentially a new threat to something that we are uh, learning to live with. If you think of the pandemic as uh, something that requires a concerted set of quite extraordinary measures from governments and individuals to be able to manage it, then I think the pandemic ended when Omicron showed up last year. Because very soon, if you look at the institution of social distancing mandates or other efforts, uh, within a couple of months of Omicron showing up, there were very few mandates left in the world. Um, and so in that sense, I think the WHO announcement uh, is appropriate uh, and perhaps might have come you know, six months ago uh, as well, uh, reflecting that change from living with the disease as opposed to an emergency response to the disease. Because we're uh, changing the sort of uh, the way we describe COVID from being a pandemic to uh, a disease that is present does not mean it is benign. It is actually still a very major threat to the elderly and to those with comorbidities. And I think it's very important that we adopt the mindset, each individual, and then for certain communities at risk of managing immunity because we can get immunity from vaccination. That's the safest way to get immunity, uh, but it wanes. You can get immunity from infection that also wanes over time. And so roughly speaking at about six months since your last infection or vaccination, uh, immunity against severe disease is still pretty good. It's still you know high 80% as far as we can tell, but it may well start to decline quite a bit more after that point. And so very important to get a booster if you're in that risk group uh, to maintain that immunity if you haven't been vaccinated or been infected in the last you know, six to 10 months, let's say. Now, we also should remember that vaccination and past infection isn't really going to protect you from getting sick. Uh, it's the main thing it does is protects you from having severe illness, going to hospital or dying. And so that's also part of learning to live with COVID and managing the important thing, which is immunity against severe disease. We've had waves of uh, Omicron sublineages, you know, BA1, BA2, BA5, XBB, uh, Kraken, now Arcturus. And this is what we expect to see, which is the continued versions of Omicron that is very highly transmissible, but not that severe unless you're in an at-risk group. And in some sense, uh, this turnover of variants is what we expect to see. It's, it's much better for us all than a completely new variant that replaces Omicron and might go back to being more severe. So nothing particularly uh, alarming so far that we've seen for Arcturus. Uh, and in fact, you know, it may be the mechanism by which we block worse variants uh, emerging because of the high transmissibility of these Omicron sublineages. We need as a, as a uh, local, national, global community to make sure that the surveillance around the world to detect a bad version of COVID, if it does occur, as early as possible is paid for and sustained, because that's going to be a critical part of protecting ourselves against what we hope is a low probability, but still a distinct risk that we go back to a more severe variant that is very transmissible and catch us all off guard. And so that's, that's the most thing, maintain our vigilance. And the way we do that is by encouraging governments to invest in good uh, active surveillance and transparent reporting to the world. Look, preparing uh, anticipation and preparation for uh, either future COVID outbreaks or future pandemics from some novel pathogen uh, or an existing pathogen 
is, as we've learned, incredibly important for protecting people's health and actually protecting people's livelihoods as well. Are we in a better place than we were for COVID? Um, perhaps not. Perhaps we have not really made the progress we need to. We need, there are, you know, attempts to invest in better labs and having more, uh, you know, efforts at surveillance. It's, it's not sure we've made enough distance on that and, and the resources may not be there. But if you go back to the beginning of COVID, it wasn't even the speed with which we learned about the outbreak in Wuhan. It was the slowness with which governments around the world, with a few exceptions in Southeast Asia, uh, it was the slowness of the rest of the governments around the world in reacting. It took many, many, many weeks before governments took the threat seriously. If they had acted earlier, it would have been, uh, we could have avoided potentially a lot of the deaths that did occur. And the, the tricky part here is that there are infectious disease uh, potential threats emerging every day. There's five or six potential threats that gets uh, announced on various alert systems on a daily basis. And it's sifting through that huge volume of, of essentially noise to find the signal of a real threat and then getting the balance of the costs of inaction versus the costs of action, both in terms of the toll on human lives and the economic costs, it's getting that right. And we haven't yet made progress on that really challenging decision-making process of you know, jumping on the thing that we need to jump on without having the world shutting down you know, uh, you know, week after week as potential threats are, are evaluated. And lastly, I think we need to make sure that we uh, continue investing in the tools that will allow us to respond quickly if and when a new pathogen emerges. You know, the, the, the uh, innovations in diagnostics, the innovations in how we make vaccines, uh, the innovations in antivirals uh, as examples, where we could have a better set of tools that we could then react even more quickly than we did uh, for COVID-19.